e Africa, e Vele too. Uh, first of all, I want to express my appreciation, deep and profound appreciation uh, for uh, this convention. Uh, Comrade Jesse Neville, uh, Chair of Uhura Solidarity Movement, uh, Comrade Penny Hess, who has been in the trenches for such a very long time and who bears much of the responsibility for the victories that we have accomplished up to now. Uh, many of which are not recognized by many of us. Sometimes when you're in the trenches, you're just on the front line. You don't, you can't see everything that's going on. You just see what you're doing. And too many times we judge our success by what we're, what's happening in the trenches right where we're involved. But we're in part of an entire global process, global project. We've been thrust into motion. Uh, by forces in history that's uh, dominated the world for a very long time, oppressed the peoples of the world for a very long time. And sometimes because of that, we can't see uh, the heroism uh, that uh, that's represented in the struggles we're involved in. I see people here from Veterans for Peace, and you know what I'm talking about, being on the front lines. And you don't necessarily see everything, you just know what you got to do right there on the front lines. <clears throat> I want to say that... Uh, First of all, that uh, we're talking about so many different things here. Uh, you're living at a time where history is condensed. And that, uh, you know, you know, I've been involved in this work like some of you who are here uh, for a long time. And it took years, uh, sometimes decades, uh, for people to understand certain questions. And then what we see now is that things that it took decades uh, often for people to understand or, or, or learn is happening in days, you know, uh, weeks, you know, people have been thrust into motion. 25-year-old kid that we're talking about in terms of Aaron Bushnell, you know, uh, the, the, the 50, 60 years I've been involved in the movement, pushing these issues and questions like that and uh, et cetera. Bushnell, boom, 25 years old, uh, he's got it and uh, trying to do something with it. So uh, this is a critical moment in history when time is moving just like that. <clears throat> and we're in an incredible convention now. I had the displeasure uh, uh, watching uh, <laughs> the other night, uh, uh, this uh, presentation that was being made about this man, Joseph Biden. <laughs> and I don't know how many of you saw that. That was extraordinary. And everything about it was artificial, contrived. You know, Biden's presentation, this grinning, silly Negro woman who was sitting behind him, uh, nodding on cue, grinning on cue, uh, automatons all. Then everybody in there, uh, not just those people who uh, hierarchical uh, to this project, but uh, all the others who were in there, who uh, uh, that's such an artificial uh, kind of thing. And then I'm thinking to myself, uh, what they have, what they continue to try to do is give the world the impression, give us the impression that our only options, Joe Biden and Donald John Trump. Can you think about this? What, what does this mean uh, to the people? They look out in the world for leadership and the only thing they can see are Joe Biden and Donald J. Trump. These are the only alternatives that the people are being confronted with, which is why they will come to your house pre-dawn, five o'clock in the morning, using flashbang grenades and armored vehicles and things like that to shut us up so that the world can't see anything else, so that there appears not to be any alternative other than these clowns. They are almost buffoonic in terms of their significance, but that's what's being presented to us and to the world as the only thing that we have to rely on, which is extraordinary. Uh, and as you know, uh, by the way, everything that uh, that I'm wearing right now uh, comes from Russia. <laughs> the hat, the outfit, right? Uh, this is the Soviets wore this. And uh, 
I want to say something about Russia. Because uh, as you know, I've been accused of having gone there, which is true. <laughs> <laughs> and this is an instance where our oppressors will use a fact uh, to obscure the truth, yeah. right? Yeah, I went to Russia, right? And uh, I liked it. Russia was different. Uh, the white people there were different from the white people I know in other places around the world. <clears throat> I know why that is the case. Because, and that's, that's related to what it is that we're talking about, the significance of the African Revolution in terms of moving history forward now for everybody on, on the planet Earth. And why it's different is because Russia came into modernity differently from the rest of Europe. And how did the rest of Europe come into modernity? Through slavery and colonialism. This is what thrust the rest of Europe into modernity uh, uh, through capturing, colonizing, rape, pillage of the rest of us. And then certainly that's true of African people, which is the reason why you find few African people with Russian last names as compared to what you find here. So, so uh, I'm in Russia. I saw this man, Tucker Carson. He was lambasted uh, because he talked about the difference in the metro or the subway system in Moscow and what you find in this country. Well, Tucker, I could have told you that, you understand? Uh, because that was one of the striking things for me too. I mean, you go into what's supposed to be the subway, there are art pieces, uh, there's sculptures all over the place, cleansiness. Uh, you don't see people were mobbing each other, uh, pushing them in and out of the subway. There's music. There's Paul Robeson, a black man who they put in prison, uh, who they actually put on before the House of Un-American Activities Committee in the Congress, uh, a black man singing the international in Russian. This, this, there's. Pushkin uh, Center Park. And Pushkin is the literary Makeda. This is a black man who looks sort of like you, who was in Russia, and he is the literature giant, historically, of, uh, of Russia. And they've got a place for him. You know, a um, park uh, that's there for him. And then when I'm walking through the communities or I'm in the restaurants and things like that, uh, it ain't like France. Despite what people have talked about, how James Baldwin and all these other people rushed to France because there was freedom there. No, 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 no. There was freedom there. Uh, that was a whole different situation because if you've been to France, it's like being in Mississippi during the height of, uh, in Paris, it's like the Mississippi during the height of the whole struggle for civil rights, et cetera. But Russia, same thing true in Germany. Uh, I, I lived in Germany for something like three years and what have you, when I was in the U.S. Army even though in Germany it was much, and this is some few years after the, the military defeat of Nazism, it was better in Germany for black people than it was in this country that I had come from. In fact, many black people who came there stayed in Germany uh, uh, since that time, uh, but the Russians were different and because they have a whole different experience. And culturally, uh, being brought into modernity, how did the Russians get brought into modernity? Through revolution. Revolution, overturning the czar uh, 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 against all the wishes of the only co other colonial powers. And the other colonial powers during this time were engaged in a fight to redivide the world among themselves as white people. This is even during the time frame where you see the Balfour uh, Declaration. Uh, you know what the Balfour Declaration is, don't you? That's when, uh, when uh, England had decided they were going to give Palestine to these white people. That's who they gave it to. I don't give a damn what anybody. They gave it to white people to go to take care of that particular area of the world for white people for the control of the resources, the land, uh, and the oil and other resources there, and of course, that Suez Canal, uh, 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 that Red Sea terrain through which so much of the world's resources leave to go to Europe. Balfour Declaration during that same period. 
Same period we're talking about what? The sykes Peacock Agreement uh, that was uh, put in place where, uh, Fran where England and France uh, had made a deal uh, that they were going to divide this particular area of the world up and share it out among themselves. And they, the, 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 what we look at today, when we look at Lebanon, when we look at Syria, the borders of Syria, Palestine, all those places, white people did that. Sykes Pico of Pico are the ones who created that. Same thing they did to Africa. You look at the uh, Africa is all split up with all these artificial borders they created, and they call them countries and nations. Africans had nothing to do with that. That was done by European colonizers. We live in a world that has been constructed, that has been constructed, this artificial relationship that they've imposed on everybody uh, and created economies uh, based on that. So Russia was different. Russian people were different. And it was nothing like what you see here. You have these images of Russians these, uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, women in, uh, in combat boots, more or less, uh, uh, you know, trotting through uh, the streets and what have you. You mind boggle when you get to Russia uh, and you see how the people actually live and you see how the people relate to Be on, I'm on a bus in Germany uh, and, and uh, I, feel, I feel the resentment. If you know what I'm talking about, if you colonized, you know what I'm talking about, I feel the resentment. Didn't get that experience in, in Russia. Didn't have that experience at all in Russia. So I just wanted to say, yeah, these are Russian clothes that I got on. I'm not a Rush, what do you call a Russo file or something like that. I, I like Russia because Russia was thrust uh, into modernity uh, through revolution, through refusal to participate with the rest of Europe. This is one of the positions of the Bolsheviks, uh, Lenin, uh, when they, they had come to the conclusion that none of these countries in Europe should join in this war to redivide the world, that instead of taking up this false line of defense of the fatherland, they should turn the so-called uh, uh, war, world war into civil war. They should make revolution. They should not allow uh, their people to become cannon fodder uh, for the capitalists fighting for their interests as opposed to fighting for the interests of the workers and peoples of the world. That was their position, which is one of the reasons they were so hated. You know what the Russians did? When the Russian revolution happened, uh, and they got the files and the archives from the czar. And they found out about the deal uh, that had been made with Pico, uh, the, 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 this whole deal, Sykes-Pico deal, and they exposed it to the world. This is how the world knew not of the, what happened. The Russians did that. The Russians refused to participate uh, in this war to redivide the world among the white countries of the world. The Russians did that. And uh, that's just historically accurate. That's what happened. And even as we talk about the numbers of people who died uh, during the, uh, the, uh, 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 the Second uh, Imperialist World War, during that era, now this is the era that uh, has been you know, defined as this great war in part for democracy, and the pretense that the war was being fought uh, to save uh, Jewish people, et cetera, uh, who made, and, and many Jews died uh, during this process. Uh, make no, 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 there's no mistake about that. But that's not, shouldn't be ever be the poster child for genocide or for murder or even for casualties. How many Russians died? Just in the Second Imperialist World War, what, 27, 30 million Russians died in that war, you see? But they concoct these fantasies, these tales that they make, uh, and they, they've got the brains of the peoples of the world, and certainly in this country, locked into that understanding. So uh, I wanted to say that Comrade Penny has uh, made a presentation that uh, you know, quoted Karl Marx, which was an impressive uh, statement that he was able to make in terms of understanding how this whole social system came into existence. 
Uh, there are other things that you could read, and I, I, I would hope that you would read. Uh, one is a history of Africa uh, by a man named Jose Jaffe. There are others uh, who uh, were historians that did some really important work because uh, even Marx's work uh, is based on the premise that history began in so many ways uh, with uh, Europe. And even Marx's uh, worldview was informed and compromised by the fact that uh, he did live and experience in Germany and Europe, and uh, and their worldview uh, were, uh, was a worldview that was constructed off a colonial relationship. I mean, Karl Marx uh, is writing Das Kapital, which is one of the most influential books uh, that's ever been written. Uh, and uh, next, other, <laughs> so the one that was written by God, uh, other, uh, uh, that's referred to as, as the Bible. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that was a bad joke, uh, <laughs> but uh, the thing is that uh, uh, Karl Marx, as he's writing Das Kapital, uh, he's uh, being fed and, and, and by, uh, by, uh, by his friend, Frederick Engels, uh, and his Frederick Engels is getting his money from his daddy, and his daddy was a capitalist. And his dad was a capitalist that was getting much of the resources that he got uh, from his Caribbean slaves, who people who were picking uh, cotton in the Caribbean. And this is a textile industry. And he was feeding Marx. So here's Marx writing about the, 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 the world and being informed uh, uh, what the world uh, is going to look like uh, and how the industrialized workers of the world uh, were fighting against the, the industrial capitalists of the world, uh, the industrial workers of the world will, will uh, be, uh, the outcome will be the, the rise of communism, a classless society. But the Africans who were picking the cotton uh, that allowed Marx to write the book where he was making this prediction they were not part of the industrialized working class. Uh, the industrialized working class were white. And the predictions he was making were predictions based on this pedestal that he was resting on that he has defined already uh, as the foundation for the capitalist system. So he wasn't talking about me. Uh, we were among the uncivilized people who were referenced in those in those books, but that's all right. The fact is, we do have history, and uh, this is something that uh, I wanted to say. And part of what makes this this convention so very important, and your presence so very, very, very important, because we represent uh, the great victory of the people against a rotten, foul social system that pukes things like Bidens and Trumps uh, uh, and other forces that work against the life of the peoples and the planet Earth itself. This is an extraordinary convention that we're having, and we have broken this process up uh, where, where uh, there is this perception uh, that the world is dominated by this whiteness and, and, and that the people do not have agency who are oppressed because none of the colonized people are supposed to have agency. And even when Karl Marx talks about this primitive accumulation of capital where he defines all these things that happened with the internment of the indigenous people and the cruelty that's been imposed on the people in the East Indies uh, 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 and, the, and turning Africa into a, 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 a warrant for the commercial hunting of black skins. Even as he's talking about that, he was talking about this as a part of the process of developing capitalism for Europe. What he's talking about, he has taken away our agency and make our involvement in history something that serves for the development of Europe. So here is how capitalism gets started, he said, by slaving people, by doing all these other things. This And this was described by Marx and others, Marxists, as progress, progress in human history. Do you understand the point that I'm making is that, that Marx describes all these things that happens to us uh, uh, as, as, as significant only uh, as it related to the development of Europe, of white people, 
There is no further discussion about how it has undermined modes of production in Africa. There's no discussion coming there about how it has undermined, that is to say, how do people, how were African people creating and recreating life before this happened? We don't create life for ourselves anymore. We are thrust into this process where we create life for white people, for Europe. This is what that meant. This has taken away our agency. But we do exist. We did exist before Karl Marx was ever born. We exist. We were fighting for our freedom before Karl Marx was ever born. We were fighting for our freedom. We had agency then. We have agency now, despite all the efforts that are being made to destroy any evidence of that. So did the people of Palestine have agency. People in Palestine had agency before the first white person set their foot there and redefined it. There were Jews who lived in Palestine peacefully. Uh, Palestinians were Jew had different religions, Jewish, Muslim, Christians, what have you, were right there. And they took this land, they took this territory and then disappeared, the Palestinians. That's what renaming them is all about, disappearing the Palestinians. That's why I ended up having a name, my last name for my father and his last name was the name of a white man disappearing Africa in us, etc. We don't even have any exist. Can you imagine the impact that has on a people to be disappeared, even their own perception of themselves? Can't even get to my own identity. When I look, try to look myself up, when I go to history, my, my father was given the name Waller. Uh, he didn't give it to himself. Somebody gave it to him, and they would brand us if we did not accept the name. And they would beat us and do all kinds of cruel things, amputate us if we didn't accept the name. We tried to use our own names. That's what they're doing in Palestine right now. Use your own name. We will bomb you. We will kill your children. That's what they're doing right now. That's what they've done to Africa and other colonized people historically. They would remove us from history. And then they would define reality for all of us. We are here. Not only are we here, we have broken up the absolute solidarity that there has existed between the settlers in this instance, or the colonizers, if you will. Because settler colonialism has been a fundamental instrument of this entire process. I say settler colonialism, I'm talking about Leonard Peltier. Here we are in a situation where we have to talk about they, they, they framed him. Uh, they they uh, lied on him. They used illegal tactics. Hell, their presence, the presence of the colonizer, the settlers, that's the gut, that's the problem. It's their court. They put Nat Turner on trial. What did Nat Turner do? He, he rose up against slavery in 1831. And he, he said, slay the slave master. Strike at night and, and spare no one. And when they finally captured him, they put him on trial. The problem is they found him guilty on the trial. But the problem is that even if they had found him not guilty, he never would have been free. Under colonialism, that's what colonialism is. The colonizer makes the law. And colonialism, by definition, has enslaved the people. That's the process that we're looking at. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is the thing that we are breaking out of. Yeah. This is the thing we're in 117 cities right now in this country and growing. We have solidarity forces who are working, taking out the message of solidarity, taking out this whole thing that undermines, that, that disrupts the entire colonial project. This is the victory. This is the victory. We say free Leonard Peltier. We say free Leonard Peltier uh, because the crime, if there is to be defined one, is the one that was committed against him and his people. And that for Leonard Peltier to have picked up a gun 
someone, I think it was Mao Zedong, that once said that uh, that in a war of national liberation, that uh, that any act against the the by the the oppressed nation is an act of self defense. Any act is a self is an act of self defense. We we in this situation we have to say free Mamiya, he didn't do it. We don't say Che didn't do it. We love Che because he did it, right? We love the oppressed because they fought back. And it's our responsibility to make this struggle right here so that we can hold up those who fought back, who do fight back, who can say, let's go. They said, Brandon. <laughs> That's the poor joke. <laughs> but there's somebody who gets it. <laughs> so they made this assault on us. Uh, they want to pretend that we have no history. Uh, they come at Penny has read the charges against us. Uh, we had the audacity to run people for office in St. Petersburg, Florida. Jesse was one of them, ran Jesse for mayor. Should have seen Jesse was a bad yeah. candidate for mayor. <laughs> ran people and they were talking about reparations and uh, all these other kinds of questions. And they said, the Russians paid us to do that. <laughs> you know what? I don't know if there's any Russian who's ever had the experience of having their church bombed by white people and sometimes in hoods and having their children uh, water hose, high power water hose used against their children just because they want to register. They said the elections in, in, in Russia, it's rubber stamped. Hell, the elections in this country are bombed. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, they, you know, this is the history we, we've got. They can get away with it because they're, the settlers up to now, the other colonizers have allowed them to do that. But you can tell the truth. This is what this is about, taking this out to the world. Uh, and they the Russians, I don't know if the Russians had that experience of, of, uh, of uh, church bombings and assassinations. I know the Palestinians had those, those that experience yeah. Yeah. of having their mosque bombed and stuff like that when they were taken over. I don't know if the Russians had that experience. How are the Russians going to teach us about that? Yeah. How are the Russians going to teach us uh, something about, about you can't participate, uh, uh, you, you, you have to talk about reparations. You know, uh, the Russians are not the ones who robbed us, looted us, and things like that. It was Americans who did that. It was it was the Europe Europe that did that. And uh, so I just think it's uh, this whole notion that so they would destroy our history. And we are not supposed to be able, in this case, we just have to talk about Russia, that Russia hired us. This is the charge. This is, on, this is what the discussion is supposed to be restricted to. We're putting you on trial because you were working for us. We don't want to hear the fact that you were doing this stuff for 50 years before uh, this thing happened. I love the thing John McCarthy back there. He did an incredible presentation I saw at the convention of the CPI. Uh, and he was talking about how these charges are so fallacious and how uh, we uh, did. And he was holding up the book, uh, 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 Reparations Now, that we uh, have just republished. And he was talking about this book, and he said that in, in 1982, uh, we did uh, uh, this uh, tribunal in New York City. Uh, uh, and, and the tribunal was based on international law, talking about genocide. The, and he, they charging us with uh, being employees of the Russians. And they, there's a particular man, his name is Alex Ionov, who they said uh, was the one we were working for. And then you know, McCarthy makes the point, well, hell, they did this. This tribunal in 1982, Einhoff was, was born in 1987. So it looks like the Russians not only have uh, developed uh, some of these other incredible things, but they've, they've developed time travel uh, so that Einhoff could you know, go back and do these kinds of, it's ridiculous, isn't it? But they want to remove the fact that it's ridiculous by, by denying us the ability to, ha to have access to the history in the trial. That's why they attack us. They want to make sure that there's no history before them. And what they want to charge us with, uh, what they've done is they've said that we were created uh, by the white man, right? And our crime uh, is picking another white master. This is the crime. 
And of course, uh, your evidence, of course, that that's a lie. And your presence is so important because uh, the whole social system rests upon the foundation of enslavement of Africans and other colonized people around the world. I just want to be redundant. Uh, the world that we live in, it does, uh, it is one that uh, with a defining uh, mode of production. The Marxists talked about a mode of production. And as they described it, uh, history uh, went through this vertical kind of process of development from what they referred to as communal, uh, uh, of, what they, of primitive communism. Uh, <laughs> that's because only we had it. <laughs> but the indigenous people, they used, they came up with this uh, whole concept uh, based on uh, uh, something done by an anthropologist in this country. Uh, his name escapes me at this moment that Engels used as the basis of, uh, what, what was the name? Henry Morgan, right? Morgan. Yeah. And uh, so uh, they, and they studied the Iroquois in this country, right? Iroquois, in this, on this landmass here. <laughs> and there was no oppression. No exploitation. Women were not treated like pets and things, house pets and things like that. And then there were other examples of this occurring. And so they took this and universalized it because uh, and and made the assumption that since uh, where white people were at the time, that uh, this was the highest expression of human development. Therefore, what they saw with the others of us uh, was primitive. Was beginning of this whole process that led to where they were, where women were treated like house pets at best, you know, otherwise uh, otherwise enslaved and, and women and children. Uh, so, so Marx uh, talked about this. And then from this uh, development, uh, another, and this mode of production was defined primarily by, by common sharing and ownership of everything. Uh, so there was not this kind of exploitation and oppression. And then he talks about, uh, how the next mode of production would be slavery. And uh, I won't try to get you the logic that comes to this concept of slavery becoming the next mode of production. Now he's talking about in human development. He's not, he's, he's appropriating history from the Iroquois and other people and sticking it here. And he's talking about this is the process of human development. He talks about how slavery was the next thing. And uh, and you are too young to remember Kirk Douglas and Spartacus and things like that. Uh, and that's a poor joke, but uh, I understand there's a series on now with Spartacus and, uh, 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 but you, you have uh, slavery being the next thing. And slavery is when uh, the mode of production where uh, the, the, the rulers of the society uh, are the ones who control the economy, own everything, including the people themselves. And then from this mode of production, the next mode of production is what is referred to as feudalism. Well, feudalism uh, was something that did uh, exist in Europe. And then he talks about feudalism is where, uh, where the workers, uh, the people who labor do get something, uh, but only get a portion of what it is that they create and they're trapped on the land. And so if the land is sold, they go with the land. They're not sold as, as on the, this previous thing that they talked about. They're not even talking about us. They're talking about Kirk Douglas. Uh, uh, so the next thing that happens, uh, uh, this feudalism, they said from feudalism, then there is this move to capitalism. This is a really extraordinary thing because they can't explain the move to capitalism without going, Marx goes to this place of primitive accumulation he said, because before there can be capitalist production, there must be capitalist accumulation, capital accumulation. He said, but before there can be capital accumulation, there must be capitalist production. He said, we can only get out of this vicious circle by presupposing the existence of accumulation of capital that did not come as a consequence of capitalist production, but was a starting point. This starting point, he said, was primitive accumulation turning Africa into a world for the commercial of honey skin versus, plus other kinds of things. So this is, this is uh, how he saw the development of human society. And this is a vicious circle that people have been trapped in. There was no meaningful explanation uh, how Europe got from feudalism to capitalism. And from, from capitalism, we're supposed to go to communism, the real thing now. It's the real thing now because this is something that happens with the industrialized workers and the industrialized uh, 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 bourgeoisie, uh, ec economy, et cetera. Uh, so uh, it's a really interesting trip that he's taken us on. But we see the fallacy of this. 
And he was saying this when none of us could participate in the discussion with him. Nobody could, nobody was, uh, I mean, they were debating all over Europe. You had the emergence of anarchists and other kinds of forces who were there, Bakunin and, and others who were involved in this discussion, but we weren't involved in this debate. And what happened, we had no agency. We were liquidated as forces. And now we are re-entering history. That's the point that we were made. And we are re-entering -enter history and we're breaking down all of those walls and falsehoods uh, that came as a consequence of previous modes of production in Europe. And we're exposing that there was a mode of production uh, that, that gave rise uh, to the whole capitalist system in a different way than what Marx was able to do. And that we are, we are liberating everybody because for the first time in history, uh, with the imposition of slavery and colonial slavery, there was also the emergence of a world economy for the first time in history. It locked the whole world into a single economy, a single mode of production, not a European mode of production, uh, not an African mode of production, a single mode of production came into existence for the first time because there was a single world economy that came out of the enslavement, colonial enslavement of African people. That's how there is anything in what they call South America. That's why there's an American period. You know, here we are, indigenous land. We don't even see the indigenous people. If we do, we don't recognize them. Then concentration camps, nobody even speaks about it. They call them Indian reservations. This is Leonard Peltier that we are talking about. This is what gave rise to Leonard Peltier and the wounded knee and all these other struggles. And the laws that will be able to put them in prison for fighting to recapture their own resources and their own dignity. And when I talk about dignity, it's a two-edged sword because certainly the dignity of African people, the dignity of the Palestinian people, the dignity of the indigenous people here, that's, a, that's something that's at stake. But the dignity of white people, there's nothing dignified about being a slave owner. There's nothing dignified by, by, by accepting uh, uh, this as your legacy. This stuff has to go. And all of us have to be engaged in the struggle of overturning the indignities that have been imposed on the rest of us by colonialism, the colonial mode of production. And this is why the struggle for Africa is such a critical struggle because it all started with Africa. Little tiny, non-significant Portugal steps out of Portugal mixed in 1415 and began this process of attacking Africa, capturing black people, and, and that something became contagious. It started off as a policy by Portugal, and then it was a policy that was adopted by others, including the, the white people who came to Palestine and took their land. It was a policy started that took uh, white people from Europe into uh, Africa and created things like South Africa, liquidating the history and tradition of the people there. This is what we're looking at. And this policy, when it started off as a policy, now becomes a mode of production. It is no longer a policy. It is the way the whole economy of the world functions. Everybody who is existing in the world today, engaged in the process of producing production of life, functions within that mode of production. And we're disrupting it. It has to go. And we're doing this, and this is the shoulder. This is what we carry on our shoulders here. This is the significance of the solidarity move. They've been able to depend on, depend on white people. The white people have been the weak link in the whole international revolutionary project in the world. Why do you think the only meaningful revolutionary project you ever saw happen with white people is Russia? No, why? Russia, so-called semi-feudal country. Russia that refused to participate in the dividing the world and creating this mode of production. Russia that be, has become an enemy of the whole uh, project since then. Russia made a revolution in 1917. Russia exposed Balfour Declaration. Russia uh, uh, exposed the people like Sykes who were involved also uh, 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 in some of these other crimes against particularly the Palestinian uh, and Arab people, etc. And in 1918, this Russia, uh, and they needed, by the way, they needed uh, the Balfour Declaration. The British did, not because they loved Jews. And in fact, they said it in different instances. You look at some of the documents because, uh, because uh, they needed, uh, because uh, with the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, uh, that was where Germany uh, 
uh, united with the, the Germans and the Ottomans were united. They needed uh, Russia who refused to participate in the war. They needed to be able to win Europeans uh, to side uh, with uh, this war that they were made in, making uh, 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 against Germany and the Ottomans. And so the assumption was that this thing with the Jews in Europe uh, would give them allies and would help to make that thing happen so that they could capture, uh, they can make that successful revolution that would continue to dominate the world. Anyway, I know it's a rather rambling uh, kind of presentation, uh, but uh, I hope it was helpful. And uh, let's build this uh, movement. Let's build this movement. Yeah. Uh, come at, uh, uh, Justice says that we need another thousand people. Seems to me that uh, that people, if they can hear us and see us, they're coming to us. Because yeah. otherwise, they're stuck with Biden, Kamala Harris, yeah. and John, uh, what's this guy's name? Trump, uh, <laughs> Donald John Trump. Uh, that's a hell of a place to be in. And uh, given an opportunity, people would go some other places. And this whole question of free speech is critical. You know, uh, we talked about 1984 uh, as something that was really exemplifying this struggle for free speech. But the fact of the matter is, what has been characterized as an extreme act of protest by Aaron Bushnell, one reason it was extreme uh, is because New York Times wouldn't run the stuff that was happening to the Palestinian people. Because Zuckerberg wouldn't let you say anything about what was happening to the Palestinian people. Uh, there, as much as anything else, this was a, a free speech uh, act that he took. This was an act that people make to be heard uh, because they would bomb you at five o'clock in the morning or they would find other ways to shut you up uh, otherwise. So thank you, comrades. Let's build the uh, Uhuru Solidarity Movement victory uh, to the oppressed of the world, destruction of colonialism and everything that reeks of colonialism, every aspect of it, there's nothing legitimate about it, it's worse than pornography. Uh, so uh, let's uh, move uh, to destroy that in the very foundation of Bidenism and Trumpism and Democratic Partyism and all this other kind of stuff. But let's make this revolution, uh, let's free the peoples of the world in the process, we become free as well. Uhuru. Thank <laughs> you.